Good afternoon and welcome to our final Reformed Church Center program for 2023. We are very pleased that it is the um, annual Pop and Young Lecture in Reformed Worship. Um, and we are very pleased that Adrian Thorne is going to be our lecturer this year, and we are looking forward to hearing from her very shortly as we discuss worship that dismantles power and privilege. Adrian Thorne is the eighth senior minister of the historic Riverside Church in the city of New York, the first African-American woman to hold the position. She received a Master of Divinity degree from Pacific School of Religion, completed postgraduate studies in pastoral care and counseling at the Blanton Peel Institute. She is a healer, <coughs> excuse me, a Presbyterian minister and a classically trained dancer who uses movement to heal bodies in the church and the community. Um, her background is in the performing arts and that includes credits with the Dance Theater of Harlem, the Metropolitan Opera and the Radio City Rockettes among others. When she's not parenting, pastoring, creating, or mentoring, she's probably scuba diving in a coral reef, or she's out on a squash court, or she's in the dance studio um, and thinking about what new things are possible. So her, um, we welcome Adrian. The response to Adrian will be given by the Reverend Dr. Neil Pressa. And I took, you know, right before this, Neil, I told you I, we weren't going to use titles, and there I went and did it. Anyway, Neil is Associate Professor of Preaching and Worship and Vice President of Student Affairs and Vocational Outreach here at New Brunswick. He is an ordained minister of the Word and Sacrament in the PCUSA, was moderator of the 220th General Assembly of the PCUSA, and presently serves on the World Council of Churches Central Committee and Executive Committee as moderator of the World Council's Finance Policy Committee, a member of the Strategic Planning Working Group, a member of the Green Village Steering Committee, and as co-vice chair of the third round of bilateral dialogues between the Episcopal Church and the Presbyterian Church USA. His degrees come from the University of California, Davis, San Francisco Theological Seminary, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Drew University. Right now, it's good to welcome Adrian. Thank you so much, James, for the introduction. Uh, it's good to be here with you and with Neil. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to start my timer so that I don't go over. Um, and we have time for hopefully a rich and robust conversation in the end. So I wonder if we might begin our time together this way. I'd like us all to just take a deep breath and pause for a moment and think about one of the best meals you've ever experienced. And then think about why. What made that best meal the best meal? So we're gonna hold for just a couple of heartbeats and let you gather your thoughts. And now I'll open us with prayer and invite you to hold that best meal image in mind as I present. Our prayer is the poem, Butter, by Elizabeth Alexander. My mother loves butter more than I do, more than anyone. She pulls chunks off the stick and eats it plain explaining cream spun around into butter. Growing up, we ate turkey cutlets sauteed in lemon and butter. Butter and cheese on green noodles, butter melting in small pools in the hearts of Yorkshire puddings, butter better than gravy staining white rice yellow, butter glazing corn in slipping squares, Butter, the lava in white volcanoes of hominy grits. Butter softening in a white bowl to be creamed with white sugar. Butter disappearing into whipped sweet potatoes with pineapple, 
butter melted and curdy to pour over pancakes, butter licked off the plate with warm alaga syrup. When I picture the good old days, I am grinning greasy with my brother, having watched the tiger chase his tail and turn to butter. We are Mumbo and Jumbo's children, despite historical revision, despite our parents' efforts, glowing from the inside out, 100 megawatts of butter. So I can't imagine what you're feeling in your bodies. I hope you had lunch before you got here. That may have your your mouth watering. But I wanted to share that poem as a way to invite you into how I think about worship, uh, worship that dismantles power and privilege, and and one way that we can bring um, other voices, um, creative voices, um, into the worship space. Every Sunday, our faith communities come to worship hungry. And so it matters the care and the intentionality with which we go about preparing the Sunday feast and welcoming God's beloveds to God's table. As I journeyed through the process of becoming the eighth senior minister of the Riverside Church in the city of New York, a church that names itself as international, I became very clear that my vision of worship centered the table and how appropriate for us in the Reformed tradition. When I studied sacraments with Reverend Dr. Tim Brown, I loved his image of the pastor hosting a celebration on Sundays that God prepared, where the task of the pastor was to throw open the doors of the church and welcome everyone outside to the table. Now, I love hosting folks at my home, and I love that God hosts us every worship at a banquet table roomy enough for all the children. But to welcome all the children takes thoughtful consideration. What chairs are needed for children and which seats will be comfortable for elders? Have we left space for those in wheelchairs? And is the path to the meal accessible and easy to navigate with dignity? Have we set the table with dishes and cutlery that are safe and that we won't worry over if a bowl is dropped or a glass is chipped? And what about the lighting? What about the music? Of course, I want flowers and beautiful art for guests to relax inside of, and I wanna create spaces where I can connect with them and they can connect with one another. Then of course, there's the food. Can you imagine experiencing all of what I just shared only to be served hummus. Now, don't get me wrong. I adore hummus. But when I have folks over to my place, I strive to tantalize their taste buds, to delight their palates, to give them some familiar dishes, but also introduce one or two perhaps challenging dishes, things I've discovered, things I believe they will also appreciate. I don't shock my guests with 100% never-before-tried-and-tested food, but I typically like to serve some showstopper, an appetizer, a side dish, a dessert, something different that makes them think, that makes them even perhaps say, wow, even if they never try it again, I know my guests appreciate the exposure and the effort that I've made grounded in love a desire to invite them into a world, perhaps a bit different from the one they inhabit. And in this new world, we all get a chance to try on being new people to the glory of God. And so worship for me is a feast. It's a place where everyone is nourished and no one goes away hungry. We might eat familiar food at the feast, the Lord's Prayer, a favorite hymn, and we might eat things we don't like, but that are good for us. Confessions, creeds. Now, I never loved the taste of bananas, but the potassium in them helped me deal with severe cramping when I was a professional dancer. And so again, we feast on what is needed, what is familiar, and what is surprising in worship. But you may be asking yourself, to what end? And for what purpose? 
I believe that we feast on these things to dismantle power and privilege. And because worship is the center of our life together in faith communities, the choices we make and the choices we don't make carry power and privilege. They have the capacity to bring life to those we worship with or death to those who gather, spiritual death, emotional death, and sometimes even physical death as evidenced in the church's hatred in general of trans people. So we worship to dismantle power and privilege because everything we do, everything we say, everything preaches. Markin Scholar and my New Testament professor, Marianne Tolbert, shared the story of the tiger puffer fish or fugu. Fugu must be carefully prepared. It is a delicacy, but it can also be lethally poisonous to humans. The restaurant preparation of fugu is strictly controlled by law in Japan, Korea, and several other countries, and only chefs who have qualified after three or more years of rigorous training are allowed to prepare this dish. Domestic preparation, that which is done in the home, occasionally leads to accidental death. I love this story. Because when we think about worship that dismantles systems of power and privilege, Fugu reminds us that if worship is not carefully prepared, it has the power of death. Everything preaches, and if it preaches, it has the power to give life or to take life away. Worship lifts up in powerful ways the things that matter most to a community. So I'd like to share a few stories with you. Um, when I was in seminary in uh, Berkeley, California, I had the great gift of visiting a congregation that was predominantly Asian. And that was an experience that I had never had um, in, in all this time that I've lived in New York City. But what struck me almost immediately upon entering the space is that while the congregation was predominantly Asian, all of the worship leaders were white men. So I lift that up to say that ethnicity matters. Um, and sometimes congregations will say to me, uh, we don't have diversity, we're a homogenous community, but there are ways that we can find diversity, and I'm going to share some of those with you. So you find the diversity that you can, and you lean into it, and you make it so much the norm that when it is not happening, people in your congregation will notice and they will comment. I think our sermons and the illustrations that we offer give us an opportunity to dismantle power and privilege. I once preached a sermon called Girl God that was based in the wisdom tradition, and holy wisdom is imaged as a uh, female. Uh, this prompted a mother and her daughter to approach me after worship and to just be so blown away that I would suggest uh, that God could be female. Uh, the fact that I was a female minister saying that was also very transformative for them. And what really struck me in that moment is I don't know that this mother and daughter ever thought about God being something different than a man. And I think they appreciated just having their minds uh, shifted or having things stirred up in them. I don't know that they went away thinking God was female. And, and you know, I don't need to tell you all God is neither male or female. Um, but I think it did something to them. I think it unlocked something and it freed something um, such that I can say to you that gender matters because worship, again, lifts up in powerful ways the things that matter to a faith community. With regards to children, I think a great question for faith communities to ask ourselves is who gets to occupy places of privilege and power in worship? Um, are there people under 21? leading and helping to plan worship? And what would need to change for your community to rethink that level of privilege and power? Um, there is a colleague of mine who writes about children's liberation theology. And we have um, an effort, an ongoing effort at the Riverside Church, not only to normalize the presence of children in worship, but to normalize their leadership as one way of highlighting them as a group that is marginalized. And I think marginalized without even our conscious awareness. Um, my colleague, the Reverend Amanda Meisenheimer often says that if adults and children don't learn to worship together, the children won't learn to worship at all. And so it matters to us. It's at the heart of what we are uh, shifting in my community is to have children in worship, to have children 
leading prayers, uh, serving communion, standing at the table, talk about a place of power, to have children standing at the table and serving communion um, shifts something in the children, but it has also shifted something in the adults. To watch tall, big people bend over to get the bread or to uh, take the cup and to stand up with tears streaming down their eyes um, is uh, streaming down their face, I think has been very powerful and transformative uh, for our communion for our community, as well as for our young people. Um, someone said that to hear scripture read or prayers led in the timbre and tone of a child's voice um, has just shifted so much inside of them. Uh, the last thing I'll say about children, I think um, their, their bodies are very transformative in worship as well. I once preached a sermon where I had my niece uh, play God. I stood her on a chair. I talked about sin as us folding our arms and turning our backs on God and God's great desire being to be in our arms. And when I turned back around and opened my arms, my niece jumped out of the chair um, and came flying and I caught her and, and we planned that. But I think there was something about seeing a child um, play God, something about seeing a little brown girl play God that started to shift some things for people, opened hearts and softened um, our notions of, of who God might be and who God might be for us and therefore how that God might see us. And that is a way, a powerful way, that we lift up what matters in a faith community. I believe our staff and the folks in leadership are another way uh, that we dismantle power and privilege in worship. My staff happens to be, at the moment, uh, predominantly female, um, and it is something that many women have never seen. Even though women make up the majorities of most churches and the majority of those attending seminary, most women have not seen them in power and have not seen a staff where women make up the majority. Um, and the interesting thing about that too is that the folks who tend to critique that tend to be women. So what might we do to dismantle power and privilege in those, in those ways? Even if there aren't women in your congregational leadership staff, I think inviting women's stories into our preaching is very important for congregations where women make up the majority of participants. In communities where women make up the majority, it is breaking down walls, and I believe binding up wounds to tell the stories of women, to tell stories about pay inequity, to tell stories about trans women, and to tell stories that make um, about the right women have to make choices about their bodies. There are certainly other stories, but don't let women not being in leadership keep you from bringing women into uh, into worship. Because again, worship lifts up in powerful ways the things that matter to a faith community. As we talk about children, we also are very focused at Riverside on our elders. Um, our congregation happens to be majority 65 and older. And there are messages that we send um, with the age of those leading in worship. Um, so we try to be mindful of those um, who are at uh, both ends of the spectrum, both children and seniors. And very often, seniors are left out of leading and left out of planning. So I would suggest that elders matter as well, because again, um, the ways that we lift them up or keep them away shows what matters to our faith community. I will share with you that um, worship for me as a feast is probably more like a potluck than a opportunity for me to do everything. I think of it as a collaboration, uh, that no one person has cornered the market on worship. And I believe that when we make the borders and the boundaries of worship porous and fluid, when we invite a diversity of voices into the planning, that beautiful flavors, tasty things get included in the worship feast that we would never come up with on our own. I think this also starts to normalize a new normal, where again, as I shared at the top, people are shocked if they don't see um, a diversity, if they don't hear um, a diversity of sounds, if they don't experience an expansive and richer buffet. Um, as we start to normalize this new normal, your people will say, what's going on? <laughs> why all the this? Or where are the children? Or why aren't we listening and experiencing this sort of music? 
And so our choices matter. Um, all God's children are invited and need to appear at the table. And I would say not just in their societally designated month, because women are women all year, not just in March. <laughs> um, African-American history is history all year, not just in February. So every Sunday, every choice we make, including the balance of bodies, the balance of languages, musical styles, it either upholds power and privilege or it chips away at it. And so how we use um, worship to dismantle power and privilege, I would like to share uh, a few simple ideas, but I think they are powerful. I think, first of all, you need to uh, remember in your own planning and commit to centering this notion that everybody eats. Everybody may not like everything that's served, but everybody eats and no one goes away hungry. So I keep picking on hummus. You don't just want to serve hummus. You don't want to serve only one dish. You want to ensure that healthy things that are needed, even if they are not liked, are on the table. You want to sprinkle in some surprises. You want to bring in voices, uh, sounds that folks may or may not appreciate. But as a worship leader and planner, I want you to think of it as um, training your congregation and uh, training their palate, inviting them, if that might be a better word, inviting their palate to try and sample some different things. And again, just because certain voices are not in your faith community does not get you off the hook. You can still bring in the voices of missing people, um, and I encourage you to not ignore those voices. Most churches that I have served say that they welcome everyone. But when you go in and have the worship experience, I find that they may often or only be serving hummus. And so we have to ask ourselves hard questions. Who would feel welcome in our worship space? And who would not feel welcome if hummus was all that was on the menu? or if nothing were to shift in our worship offering. A few examples that you might wanna reflect on, and this is a hard one, I think, for me, but I know that if English were not someone's first language, they would not feel welcome in most churches in the USA. Now, certainly we could say, well, English is the dominant language, but if we really are wanting to welcome people as Christ did, I think we have to think about some of these hard questions. One of the things that we have um, instituted at Riverside is other languages and not just on World Communion Sunday. So we've we started trying this out, introducing the recitation of the Lord's Prayer in other languages once a month. Um, we invite people to pray the prayer in the way that they know it and in the language closest to their heart, but then the leader always recites it in English. So we have tried it in Spanish and we will try it in other languages as time goes on. I think that is both good for those who are visiting the community, but I also think it's good and humbling for us to hear a language other than our own and to invite um, folks from our community who speak some languages other than English to have an opportunity to step into that leadership space. Um, that is a dismantling of power and privilege. I think asking ourselves the question about the ages that might not feel welcome in our Sunday worship spaces and what we can do maybe this Sunday or this month or this year, even if it's just one thing, to focus on addressing that. I will say that my my child, who is 13 years old, tells me often <laughs> that my sermons are boring, and that's a problem. It's one that I'm working to address, have not quite figured out how to do that to make 13-year-olds feel welcomed in a sermonic space. It is it is a challenge, um, but I'm here for it, and I'm happy to continue talking and grateful that my kid um, will give me feedback. But another, another um, area that I think helps to dismantle power and privilege um, is architecture and art. Uh, we have beautiful marble floors um, at the Riverside Church. But while they are beautiful and durable, they are extraordinarily harsh for children when they fall. And they are extraordinarily slippery for seniors who may be walking with um, canes or walkers and other and other aids. So I, I just encourage you to look at your space and consider um, how it might resonate with someone who's five years old 
how it might resonate with a 55-year-old, which might be very different from how it resonates with an 85-year-old. So age is an area of power and privilege that we can consider, along with ethnicity, gender, and all of the areas that I'm sure you are familiar with. The way that we plan worship, the way that we serve the feast, shapes the life and the faith of our community. So our willingness to be open to planning that is collaborative, just that step, inviting people into the process, that immediately dismantles power and privilege. It's a wonderful space for people to learn and to teach one another. It's a two-way street of learning because one person and a group of similar persons cannot see everything, uh, cannot make all the dishes, um, cannot feed all the people. So our Riverside weekly worship meetings, we have now invited lay leaders to join us. And that came from hearing them say, we didn't get to say anything about what you were doing this Sunday. It was lovely. It was nice. And I will say it takes a little more time, but we have made worship even better. There are things that our members see um, that we that we will miss um, with all of our theological training um, it's so helpful to have someone say, you know, I've been at Riverside for four decades and, and here's what I know. And so to welcome people in is the, I think, an ultimate disruption of power and privilege. I served on the worship committee at my seminary for every year that I was there. And I will tell you, we had so many near fails, but what saved us um, in our weekly offering of worship was the variety of folks at the table who could say, did you realize all the leaders are women? Did you realize all the folks were straight? Um, so I encourage you, if you do not have a worship planning committee, um, to get one and try to invite different voices to be at the table. Um, I would like to think with you a bit about how we construct reformed worship that dismantles power and privilege. I believe um, an important place to start is teaching uh, members of our faith community what it means to worship. Um, I, I would love if you all would like to put in the chat, I'm not quite sure if there's a chat or there's a place for you um, to, to put comments. But based on what you've heard and what you've experienced, I would love to see your definitions of what is worship and what is worship not. Um, I think of worship as both comforting and disrupting. I think of worship as a place where we come to fuel up, to go out to do the work of justice, um, I heard Brian McLaren say once that worship is like uh, an airport. No one goes to an airport to stay. They go to the airport to get somewhere. And I love the notion that we bring people to the table to fuel them to go somewhere. I think worship is a space for all the people. I think it's communal and not necessarily personal. And I love to think about it as a community meal, if you haven't already <laughs> guessed that. I think worship is not a personal performance. I also think it's not a personal concert. <laughs> it's not purely about an individual's comfort and likes. It is a communal feast. I think it's important when we're constructing reformed worship to remember the priesthood of all believers and the notion that worship is the work of the people. And if we believe that, then we must involve the people uh, in the planning. So back to visual arts and who is fed. Uh, I think we can do surveys of our community. Uh, we can ask ourselves with our stained glass windows, who eats and who doesn't? With our iconography and art, who eats and who doesn't? Who's going hungry here? What are the voices, the, the sounds, the images that need to come into this faith community? Uh, to start dismantling power and privilege, even if those voices aren't already a part of the community. There are scriptural resources that take us outside of the dominant culture and outside of the tradition. Uh, some great ones are a women's lectionary for the whole church by Will Gaffney. There's a First Nations version of the New Testament that adopts Native American descriptors for God, and you will hear that read in worship this evening. 
um, so many books, uh, so many opportunities to dismantle power and privilege. And I would say to you, none of us will ever be well and widely read enough to do this on our own. We won't read enough, be resourced enough. But if we're curious and willing uh, to expand who sits at the worship planning table and to listen and learn from them, we will start to dismantle power and privilege in our worship. So I would like to close with this uh, beautiful parable that you may or may not be familiar with. It is called the parable of the long spoons. It says this, one day a man said to God, God, I would like to know what heaven and hell are like. And God showed the man two doors. And inside the first door in the middle of the room was a large round table with a large pot of vegetable stew. It smelled delicious and made the man's mouth water, but the people sitting around the table were thin and sickly. They appeared to be famished. They were holding spoons with very long handles, and each found it possible to reach into the pot of stew and take a spoonful, but because the handle was longer than their arms, they could not get the spoons back into their mouths. The man shuddered at the sight of their misery and suffering, and God said, you have seen hell. Behind the second door, the room appeared exactly the same. There was the large round table and the large pot of wonderful vegetable stew that made the man's mouth water. The people had the same long-handled spoons, but they were well-nourished and plump, laughing and talking and the man said, I don't understand. And God smiled and said, it's simple. Love only requires one skill. And I say, worship only requires one skill. These people learned early on to share and feed one another. While the greedy only think of themselves. And so may we set tables and serve worship that feeds one another. To the glory of God. Amen. 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 Let me first thank the Reformed Church Center under the direction of my uh, staff and faculty colleague James Brum for this invitation to offer a response and for hosting this event. Having been the Pop and Young Lecturer in 2012, I'm grateful for the Reformed Church Center's vision and mission in supporting research and writing in Reformed worship and the public discourse around it. And thanks as well to New Brunswick Theological Seminary, the school where I'm blessed every day to serve an institution that is historically committed to undoing systems of power and privilege, a commitment woven into every facet of our curriculum, co-curriculum, and culture. Let me offer a word of deep gratitude and appreciation to you, Adrian, for your 2023 Poppin' Young Lecture and for the eloquent and cogent insights that you have offered on the role of worship in dismantling power and privilege. Insights from your faithful ministry as pastor and public theologian and the prophetic witness of the saints of Riverside Church in offering their heads, hearts, and hands to God's transformative justice. Using the meal image, Adrian has prepared and served a feast to us with much to ingest, much to delight. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will cause the wisdom which she has given to us to metabolize in our hearts and minds so that we may be moved and transformed and recommit to dismantling power and privilege. So this past Thanksgiving, our home had 11 people. The best part of our feast was that everyone, every single person, co-created every dish. The kitchen was busy. The kitchen was messy. The kitchen was beautiful. Therein lies the crux of the matter of what Adrian has presented for us of what is meant by worship and its role in dismantling power and privilege. The role and work of the Holy Spirit to use the elements of worship, the event of worship, to effect to infect, and to affect transformation. What Adrian has laid out for us are the critical elements of strategic intentionality 
to foreground the diversity of the community in planning and in executing worship. The premise is that when we foreground gender, ethnicity, age, generations, sexual orientation, disability, theological and ideological diversities, the full spectrum of the beauty of God's people, the rich and deep threads that when woven together will exhibit and manifest glimpses of what the beloved community is and can be. The premise, too, is that the intentionality of inclusion will, in all likelihood, express in substance, in the actual sermon, in the actual prayers, in the actual content of what occurs in worship, all those necessary ingredients that will enable the people of God to be transformed and therefore be committed to, to dismantling systems of power and privilege in church, society, and the world. And central to those premises in Adrian's pastoral presentation is the power of story. Diverse stories and the act of storytelling are itself the feast. For after all, we are people, we are a people of the story of Jesus. Whenever and wherever we gather around the Lord's table, the table of thanksgiving, we are storied into the story of Jesus's his story. Its stories received from and shared with the people of God from east and west and north and south, they and we shall sit at table in the kingdom of God. The prayers of God's people in Gaza and Jerusalem, Kiev and Moscow, Manila, and the southern border United States, from the testimonies of God's people in Abuja, Nigeria, to Pretoria, South Africa, the strategic intentionality of inclusion of God's people and their stories and their testimonies and their songs and their music are what dismantles power and privilege. We need to include the Belhar Confession and the Accra Confession to speak to us so that we may confess the faith with and in solidarity with our siblings and ancestors. When we can exhibit diversity and do diversity, the manifestation and enactment of that, there we see the beginning of dismantling power, of the dismantling of privilege, of the undoing of those systems, ideologies, theologies that created, that engendered, that perpetuate injustice and inequity. That seems to be the premise. The what, diverse voices. The who, diverse people. The how, co-creating worship together. Mark Laberton, who is president emeritus of Fuller Theological Seminary, wrote the book, The Dangerous Act of Worship, subtitled Living God's Call to Justice. In it, he asked a pointed question, what is at stake in worship? His answer, everything. He then followed that with a sequel book appropriately titled, The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor, subtitled, Seeing Others Through the Eyes of Jesus. In both books, what happens in worship is that the Holy Spirit is doing something to us. The Holy Spirit is apprenticing us to the teachings of Jesus is giving us the lens to see our neighbors and strangers and this world through the eyes and heart of Jesus, the Holy One who desires justice to flow like a river, righteousness to come like an ever-flowing stream. Now, in liturgical studies, specifically liturgical theology, the age-old question of lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of prayer, the law of belief, it's a centuries-old question of which comes first, the act of prayer or the beliefs about prayer, the act of believing or the doctrines of what is believed, or to put it practically, thinking, believing right things in order to do the right thing, orthodoxy that leads to orthopraxy. What Adrian has laid out for us is another affirmation that Lex Orandi, Law of Prayer, and lex credendi, law of belief, go hand in hand, a mutual partnership, a mutual feasting. 
You need people who are committed to God's justice, who know the struggles of being marginalized and otherized, to plan and enact worship that intentionally has an agenda to dismantle systems of power and privilege. In order for the Holy Spirit to work in and through those elements of worship, that will transform God's people to be agents of justice. It's this, it's this divine human partnership of relying upon the spirit of justice to lead us and direct our efforts to stories, to liturgies, and prayers from the margins, as my colleague Claudio Carvalhajes at Union Seminary has done so beautifully in his books on Eucharist and liturgies from the majority world as that same spirit uses those ingredients to speak to the hearts and minds of God's people. It's, the, it's that divine human partnership with the Holy Spirit to correct us, to transform us. Because as we know, in our histories of Christianity, one can have the right thinking, one can have a good sounding theology, but not live rightly. One can have the right words and the right dogma, the orthodoxy, but commit injustices, outright evil against fellow human beings. We know and experience worship where there's holy tunes, holy tables, holy sermons, but yet traditions and churches and worshiping communities that perpetuate patriarchal leadership, that are not open and affirming, that benefit much from maintaining systems of power and privilege, even while having the right dogma and right theology. So, the orthodoxy, the lex credendi, needs the right people. Orthodoxy needs the right people to plan and envision worship. We need the intentional liturgies and prayers. We need the right stories that manifest the struggles of God's people. The stories of the struggles of, of poverty, of human trafficking, of war, the brokenness, the death and dying. The Good Fridays of the story even as we receive the promises of Holy Saturdays and Easter's of the story. But the intentionality of inclusion happens when our churches and worshiping communities are moved by the Holy Spirit to continually review and reform how we plan, what we do, who does it, who will preach, who presides at the table, and who will lead. We rely upon the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to convict us, to prompt us, and to direct us to these sources and resources. The reform adage, the church reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God and spirit, becomes alive and is very, very appropriate as we seek to be people who are continually reformed as we lean upon the spirit's leading and prompting. One other voice we must include here from a North African from the modern day city of Anaba in Algeria, which was known in the ancient world as Hippo Regius, whose one time bishop was St. Augustine. In his famed sermon 272, he preached this, quote, we become what we receive. What you see on God's altar, the bread of Christ's body, the cup is Christ's blood. Faith can grasp the fundamentals quickly, succinctly, yet it hungers for a fuller account of the matter. So how can bread be his body? And what about the cup? How can it be his blood? My friends, these realities are called sacraments because in them one thing is seen while another is grasped. Close quote. So then, when we come to the table, and in fact to all sacred tables, where we eat, where we meet, where we conduct our our daily business where we gather for Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners, we are taken, we are blessed, we are broken, we are given for the life of the world. We become what we receive, broken bodies made whole, the broken body of Christ given for the life of the world. In doing so, let us discern through the Spirit's presence and power the people who are at the table, the people who are not at the table, the people who have been excluded from the table. Let us discern what it took to bring that bread and that fruit of the vine, the laborers, the bakers, the shopkeepers, the truck drivers, the harvesters. Let us consider their wages, their health care, their families, or the absence of all. 
Let us consider so many in Gaza who go without bread and clean water, the many displaced Ukrainians who, while their country provides much wheat grain for the world, will themselves pass this Christmas tide without the benefit of tasting of that same bread in their dining room tables. It's that same bread that gives us strength to pray and fight another day, to advocate for ceasefires, to join in common cause for peace and justice and reconciliation. It's that same bread and the faith that is embodied in there that enables and empowers us to live each day in hope, strengthen in our resolve for a better and just world where all will flourish to the glory of God. It's that bread as it metabolizes in us it dismantles our own hold on power and privilege. We are indebted to you, Adrian, for foregrounding in our hearts and minds the table's emphasis on our interconnectedness, our interrelatedness, and connecting the worship partnership we have in the Holy Spirit with the existential lived struggles in our common humanity. The divine human partnership dismantles systems of power and privilege in the planning, praying, doing, and enacting worship. Amen. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mm. Presa. That was gorgeous. Yes, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Adrian. And now we all get to be part of this discussion. And um, Gilbert Pagan already has his hand up, so I'm going to invite him to unmute and go ahead and share. One second. Okay. Uh, thanks for putting on this uh, this panel. It's a very interesting topic. Um, two questions. Uh, one is, um, what are your thoughts on preaching scripture from a more originalist and textualist perspective on social cultural issues versus a progressive approach to dis in order to dismantle power and privilege? With the purpose of reaching those who come to your churches and do not agree with, let's say, a progressive interpretation of Scripture, um, and uh, by not and by not doing so, um, meaning changing uh, the preaching style, you exclude many uh, and make them feel uncomfortable. And in actuality, um, it's a tactual execution of power and privilege by not doing so. Uh, so, how do you deal with Scripture and preaching on that? would like to hear your thoughts. The second question um, is around uh, how do we address power and privilege in Black and Hispanic churches that don't have whites as part of the worship team or staff of the church or preachers, as that is also a reflection of power and privilege? And can you share some tactical strategies to address the second question? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Gilbert. Um, I, I And I may have to ask for some clarification because I'm not sure what you mean by a progressive interpretation of scripture. Um, I think, you know, there's so many ways to approach the holy text. For me, um, it's impossible to read scripture outside of what is happening in my context. Um, and I, I don't know if you're a student at New Brunswick Seminary, but this notion of the Sitzim Leben, like where I come from, you know, the world that I'm in, the world as it is, the world as we hope it will be, but also the context of the community that I'm preaching to and the context of the world um, as we see it, all of that informs the way that I preach. Um, I wouldn't call it a progressive read of scripture. I would call it, um, I don't know what I would call it. I, I just know that I cannot preach devoid of who I am, what my community is experiencing and what's going on in the larger world. Um, it sounded like in your question, and I may have this wrong and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it sounded like there, like you were maybe suggesting there's a way of interpreting scripture that is just clear and plain. And, and I just disagree with that. Um, I know that everyone who sits down with the holy text is reading it with their own lens. Um, and again, I imagine if you're a student at New Brunswick that your professors are teaching that. Um, 
And if not, I'm happy to, to share that with you. Uh, none of us come as a, as a blank slate to scripture. Um, so I read it through the lens of being female. I read it through the lens of being a mother. I read it through the lens of uh, a person whose mother was a sharecropper growing up. So there is uh, very much, um, you know, the, the stewing that I've done um, as, as someone who grew up Southern. I mean, all of those things come to play. So I'll just say that about the first question. Your second question, I think around the tactical um, suggestions, I think we're in the talk. Um, I think in the same way that dominant churches are invited to bring in other voices, I think predominantly Black and Hispanic churches can do the same. I think the illustrations that are used in sermons um, can be diversified and broadened beyond those um, in in the sanctuary, uh, they could bring in Asian voices. Um, if if men are those predominantly in leadership, they can bring in female voices. I think other other musical styles, um, prayers written in um, other uh, faith traditions, um, other you know from other ethnic groups. I think the same sort of mix can happen, and the same sort of um, invitation to a diverse and surprising table holds for. Uh, predominantly African-American and Hispanic churches as well. I hope that got at your question. James, if I may um, add, sure. add an additional uh, um, very briefly to Gilbert's, um, to the first question, um, uh, Gilbert, um, your question seems to put as a mutual exclusive uh, what you refer to as the, uh, the original textual interpretation and a so-called, quote, progressive, and I would argue, um, and I say this to my students, uh, as we look at text, context, and subtext, those dimensions of interpretation, um, that to actually be an originalist or to be faithful to the text, you have to look at um, economics. You have to consider empire. You have to consider social cultural. You have to include all those things that um, that uh, the ancestors of the faith grappled with, that Jesus grappled with. And so what is uh, labeled, quote, progressive is actually an originalist to be faithful actually to the text and the context of what is there in scriptures. Okay. And um, Nathan Jeremy Brink, um, professor of global Christianity here, at, history of global Christianity here at New Brunswick, has put a comment into the chat, um, which I invite you all to read, but I am not going to even try to read it all for you right now. But I am going to share a question that was put in the Q&A um, from an anonymous attendee who was asking Dr. Thorne, Adrian, that's, this is a great, quick and easy way to get, get, get one's degree, by the way. Um, how have you included the other abled in worship? Um, thank you for that question. I, I would share that um, our sanctuary is not very kind to physically other abled folks. Um, we have um, so many stairs um, and I have tripped and almost fallen myself. Um, so what we do in the case, I think with physically other abled bodies is that we will set up lecterns and microphones on the floor and, and then it is very easy for for elders who may have trouble with stairs, but other folks who may have trouble with stairs for other reasons um, are able to lead in worship, uh, uh, offer prayers and, and such from that place. Um, then there are, are folks who I think are other able just in terms of, um, they have different modalities of learning. I mean, and that is true across the age spectrum. And then um, I think it is very possible when you work with um, people to write prayers and what would support them in being able to lead in worship. Um, it's, it's very beautiful um, what we're able to, to offer the, the gathered community. Okay. Beth Carroll, would you go ahead and unmute and jump in? Sure. Thank you for um, this wonderful um, lecture today. Um, it's been a real gift to, to listen. So thank you. Um, my question, and I, I'm a pastor um, at Oakland City Church in Oakland, California. And um, 
we are blessed to have um, a relatively diverse congregation. Um, and my question is, one of the challenges that we have is um, in terms of both planning for worship as well as the worship uh, um, worship leadership and worship um, participation, um, you know, some of the same, you know, a lot of our uh, people of color, um, you know, people who are not straight and cisgendered in the planning and participation of worship leadership are the same people who get asked to do a lot of things, not only at our church, but um, because they're incredible leaders with many gifts in their community, in their work, um, they have finite time and energy. And so sometimes um, in the process of doing our work, um, we get a lot of no's for participation a lot because they're tired. And so um, I'm curious to hear if any, either of you have any reflections on how to care for them um, in their fullest human self and make sure their voices and gifts are included in worship. Thank you, Beth, for that question. I, I, I deeply appreciate it. And I appreciate the concern you have um, it, because it, it's real. Um, I would say, I would suggest that, that what you're doing is wonderful. I think honoring um, people's finite capacity is, is beautiful and I imagine appreciated by your community. And then I would suggest that there are many ways for us to bring in um, the flavors that um, I was talking about that don't involve what I would call visual representation. So we don't have to have, um, and this is my opinion, not everyone shares it. You don't have to get all of the black people in the church to lead the Black History Month worship, right? It doesn't have to be all the women on Women's History Month Sunday. It can be very powerful for the voices to be children or for the voices to be men. Um, but there also are other opportunities, the, the stories that are shared, the music that comes into the space. Um, there are, are moments at Riverside when we've gotten um, more intentional about putting liner notes because like our director of music might say, you know, I did all this music by LGBTQ plus composers, but if you're not a sacred music person, you're not going to know that. So it can help to signal to people that the anthem was written by this person and just, you know, put their bio in the place, uh, in the in the bulletin so that people can read because it's also, it's an educational moment, but it also is saying to people, look, we thought about um, bringing in um, other voices, other sounds, other languages um, in more ways than just inviting the people to stand up in front of you. Um, so I, I hope that is helpful. Neil, did you want to add to that or are you good? I'm good, thank you. Okay. okay. There's this young fellow named Micah. I'm gonna let him talk. Good evening or good afternoon, I should say. Um, Pastor Thorne, Dr. Pressa, Dr. Brum. I am gonna use titles. Um, and so my, my question is, I, I believe there must be prophetic voices in our pulpits and in our ministries. I believe we must focus our worship around such issues as culture, power and privilege, and context. The question I think many, particularly younger persons, whether they're progressive or they're conservative or they're moderate, are asking, how do we address the risk uh, in a zeitgeist, in, the, in a culture now that is voting against DEI, against affirmative action, that is burning books, that is giving scarlet letters to folk who would take a non-conservative evangelical position when it comes to the word of God. Um, how do we raise ministers to, to be brave enough to rage against these kinds of movements that keep coming up culturally time and time again. Uh, I still watch the movie of Martin Luther King Jr. 
in that last year after he preached at Riverside and the struggles that he had to deal with. And some people are scared of that and it's running them away from ministry. Thank you. Um, okay, I, there's a lot there. I so I, I think what what sort of lit up for me is when you said, how do we help them to rage against um, what's going on in the world? Hmm. I'm reading Taylor Branch's Parting the Waters right now and getting such wonderful insight into uh, Dr. King, uh, just so many layers and so much richness. Um, and there's a way in which uh, I, I've just come to appreciate him more, but I think in his humanity. Um, and th there certainly were times when he raged, but I think a good deal of the time, I think he was thoughtful and contemplative. And he was engaged in what I believe was this, um, this expansive table, these um, multiple flavors um, in the people he hung out with, in the, the books that he read, in the openness he had to engage someone of a uh, different faith background, someone of different perspective, um, the, the willingness he had to, to have his mind turned around, to have his heart opened in a different way. Um, and, and not to idolize him, but it, it's, it rem, it's similar to the way I, I think Jesus moved in the world and the way I think we want to move in the world at our best. So I, I think what I would say to the, you know, the young prophetic upcoming preachers is, is something along those lines. You know, we can't rage all the time. Um, and I think while rage has its place and is appropriate, I find um, more power perhaps and um, sustenance for my work to gather at the table with people and to hear their perspectives and share my own, to be willing to have my mind changed and my heart opened. Um, I, I think, you know, as I'm looking at the zeitgeist right now, I, this is what I say to the members at Riverside. We have got to be willing to walk hand in hand with someone. We can't do this work by ourselves. And maybe there are folks who don't want to take hands with us and say, okay, we don't take hands with them. But let's find the people who are willing uh, to sit at the table with us and take hands with us and move forward. To me, that is more life-giving, I think, for my ministry personally. And I also think it's what's going to shift the zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. For my part, uh, Mr. President, um, and I, I've shared this in the as a testimony to our uh, to our class there at the seminary on undoing systems of power and privilege. Um, I've been in pastoral ministry for two decades, and our my last uh, pastorate uh, here in San Diego County, um, a large, uh, white, uh, largely white affluent um, congregation, and during COVID, we had embarked. Um, the leadership had embarked on uh, starting a process of how to engage racial justice and gender justice um, in this congregation and in the community. Um, and it was hard going. Um, if you can imagine, um, I was one of few uh, persons of color on, on staff um, in this um, congregation. And I leaned upon um, a group of Filipino, Filipino American scholars um, research scholars. And it was that community that helped me to uh, not only survive COVID, but to um, survive that tense period of working with and working through um, that, that process in the, in the congregation among the leadership of the church, um, as I was offering some um, insights and some points in that almost two and a half year process in the, in the congregation, um, and it was quite challenging, but it was a group of a uh, community of of uh, uh, from from the Filipino community to to hear my heartaches and and pains. And I think so that's what I would advise. and I, and that's what I've said to my students as well at the seminary, uh, that when you're in a context uh, that is not so receptive uh, to your passion and to uh, to your vision for uh, for justice in the church and in society, um, this is where community and the community of other agents of justice are so key. Wow. 
Thank you both for that wisdom. Yes, thank you. Gloria Levine, would you go ahead and unmute and um, join us in the conversation? Well, let's just say good afternoon, everyone. This is very interesting, and I am pleased that the seminary is um, moving forward, trying to dismantle things that we all aware of. And my problem with church is problem is um, dismantling um, power and privilege that everyone is welcome to the table. The community should be diverse. So, and be involved in the church as well as in the community. But I kept running up against a brick wall and it became exhausting. And I thank God that I didn't lose my love for the church, for worship. I do a lot of things in the community. It brings me peace and joy, but I also learn a lot of keep hitting my head up against the wall. Um, there's some people just don't want change. There's some people just wanted to, for the church to stay the same. I learned to accept that and everything is in God's timing. So I kept it moving, but I truly believe that eventually we all will embrace each other. No one's better than the other. And I would truly love to see children being involved because there's a mental illness that's festering with our children, as well as the elders through COVID. Everybody's been through a lot of pressure and a lot of people don't know how to deal with it. And a lot of people don't want to go to the church to seek guidance, you know? And um, I would like to see people coming back to the church, worshiping and feeling that inspiration of worshiping together, um, seeking the relationship with God, Jesus, and the Trinity. For some reason, that's not there in most places. And I ju I'm just grateful. And only thing I just ask, even though there is talk about pro uh, power and privilege, I just pray that we um, be persistent in uh, engaging in this issue. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have a question here from actually one of my seminary classmates, Stephen Schwander. He writes, often in my journey, I have been called upon to provide leadership and preaching in a non-majority church. Today, I teach monthly in Ferguson, Missouri, and I am aware of the cultural challenges, but also the negative experiences the gathering community has, has had in their past, more congregational pastor-led churches. From your perspective, what are the gifts of reformed worship and hermeneutics that can help serve the congregation. Uh, thank you so much for that doctoral thesis question, Stephen. <laughs> um, but I, but I do have a few thoughts. Um, I, I think the. Uh, the the five sola. I, I think what first came to mind was uh, the authority of scripture for we reformed people. Um, I think 
I think there's a lot of wisdom in the scripture for these times. Um, I am someone that preaches the lectionary and we use the narrative lectionary actually at Riverside, which is really helping, I think, with our community's biblical literacy. But I feel like the lectionary um, never lets me down. Almost regardless of some surprise that happens in the world, I find that the text for the assigned Sunday um, has a word in it. Um, and I, I think the Reformed tradition's um, centering of scripture is a, is a very powerful tool for our communities and for this moment. I think uh, the priesthood of believers is also another powerful tool. And I that came to mind as you mentioned, um, or as it was mentioned that you go to non-majority churches. I think there is something uh, really powerful about a preacher who's able to help universalize the human struggle, uh, regardless of what body you show up in, regardless of the body of the folks in the congregation, I think reminding us that as baptized believers, we are part of the priesthood um, is always a way in, uh, is always a, um, a connector. And then the last thing I would say, um, you know, Calvin's doctrine of grace um, is, is part of what got me to seminary. I remember saying to uh, a mentor of mine, the Reverend Jeffrey Gargano, who's, I believe, still at the Re Reformed Church in Terrytown. Um, in Sleepy Hollow. I said, I love Calvin. And he was like, oh, you might be, you know, one of the few people. Um, but what I meant, and I said to him, you know, people have mistaken Calvin and Calvinism. And I think Calvin's doctrine of grace, that God's grace is irresistible, that God will chase us down and, you know, won't let us go, um, is good news that that all people want to hear um, and need to know. And and our ability to help them experience it in worship, I think, is one of the most delicious things about our Reformed tradition. Let me add briefly, James, to um, to Stephen's uh, question. Um, three three brief things, Stephen. Uh, one, uh, and made reference to this in the in the response. Um, the Reform motto. Um, ecclesia reformata semper reformanda secundum verbum dei, right? At spiritus, um, that we are reformed and always being reformed according to the word of God and the spirit. So that's number one, that as reformed people, uh, we are people of the reformation continually being reformed. And so that's not just a polity thing, that is a worship uh, as well. And so to continually reform and to revisit and to review uh, our, our worship, what we do and how we do uh, church. Second um, is that to be reformed is to be ecumenical and therefore um, to be um, open, welcoming, um, and integrating perspectives and voices um, from um, other ecclesial traditions and other perspectives. Uh, that's very central to being reformed. And lastly, number three, um, that we... Uh, lean upon right the the holy spirit to continually speak to us um and that we um, lean upon the power of the spirit uh um i wish that more of us re reformed folks would be pentecostal in that way uh and be very uh you know uh lean upon the spirit and and what the spirit is moving and doing um in every generation okay yeah. thank you both Robert Williams, would you go ahead and unmute and share with us? Sure. Greetings to all. Thank you, Pastor Thorne, Dr. Pressa, for your sharing today. And I'm I'm grateful for it. I, I serve as pastor of the St. Paul Baptist Church in Prince George's County, Maryland, and, and one of the D-Men students at New Brunswick, and I'm grateful for that as well. Um and I, I'm grateful for the paradigm of the table and the feast um, and and continuing to, to strive to press and push that more broadly. I do have a worship committee, planning committee from week to week. Uh, sometimes we skip a week and plan a couple of weeks in advance, but planning it. And it's a mix of several people, but you're sharing today uh, triggered a couple more 
folks that we need to include in that, uh, especially younger uh, persons. Um, you've done some of the other things that you mentioned, the other able people and all of that, and we're still continuing to go forward. The, the question I have, um, the specific question is, how do we ensure that we do not create a greater and a lesser table? And, and, and again, it goes back to your paradigm. So in many of our backgrounds, there have been around Thanksgiving, there's been the big table and the children's table. And I expand that paradigm to the church uh, where I used to pastor down in King George, Virginia, a uh, small rural church, 17, there, 17 years there, now back at my home church for nine, nine years. And where I used to pastor, they had what they call pounding the pastor. So they'd have these after after service, big day kind of meals and all of that. And the pastor sat at the head table and a few other folks, and uh, they made sure the pastor was served first and a couple of other folks, the assistant pastor. And depending on who you were, you got the lesser food, the, the you know, different potato salads, the, the you get the you get the picture. Same kind of concept as the greater and lesser table when you have the children's table at Thanksgiving. The, the, the point here is how do we how do we make certain that the table is big enough? And so so that not only everyone eats, because everyone still eats in that paradigm, but so that everyone feels equally embraced and to a great degree on the same level. Thank you so much. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, I grew up in PG County, so it's good to see um, a homeboy. Um, so I think scripture gives us the answer in the, the last will be first and the first will be last. I think those of us who have power, especially if we know we have power, you know, we stand down. Um, I know um, friends who grew up in West Africa or in West Indian cultures where the dad ate first, you know, and I'm Southern and usually, you know, my aunties, my, my grandmothers would make my grandfather or my uncle's plates first. Um, but there are other cultures where the children eat first. Um, and I think that sort of spirit is what we need um, in this metaphor. You know, if I'm the senior minister, I don't want my plate first. If my kid hasn't eaten and if the, the four and the five-year-olds who can't reach the table haven't eaten. They need to eat first. So that's how I would uh, stretch the metaphor. I think the, the marginal people need to come first and the folks with power need to stand down. And if anyone doesn't eat, it's going to be me. And I think that's the spirit of, of the leader, the leadership that I would like expect from my team or from myself. I hope, yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah. No, that that's, very helpful and, and and right on what we try to do. We're pushing. Yeah. We found it even in the area of, especially now in the area of technology. Mm. Whereas a lot of our seniors are at the lesser table. It's kind of flipped. Mm. <laughs> because the kids know, even the little kids know how to flip the technology, how to do things with streaming and all of that kind of thing. And many of the seniors are being left behind a little bit. And so we, we, we've got to build that table out a little bit more. So, but thank you. Yes, you're welcome. And I, and I think bring those marginal people to the center. I mean, that's, that's the call of the gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, Robert, I'd like to interject just with a very different experience I've had with a congregation I help out on weekends. When COVID began and we had to shut down and went to um, streaming worship and being completely online for a little bit, we thought it was the seniors we were going to lose, but it turned out that our seniors were very tech savvy with streaming because so many of them used streaming to see their grandchildren. They learned that technology because they, that was how they got to see their grandchildren. Um, so I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just um, finding ways to give the give those seniors a little bit of help getting used to the tech 
to the tech and yeah. getting comfortable with it. Yeah. We've had to do a little of that. Neil, did you want to add anything? Thanks, Dr. Pearl. That's no, just a simple word: empowerment to empower um, all um, all members of the church. Um, you know, in the church that I served in New Jersey um, years back, um, it was a small congregation, half African from Kenya and Cameroon. Um, and for every member of the church um, um, of all ages, we equip them um, to be um, comfortable in using the Book of Common Worship. Um, and so whether one was in middle school, high school, um, middle age, older adult, um, they knew the grammar of the liturgy and the reason of why things were done in such ways. And so when, uh, you know, the great prayer vigil of Easter came uh, with the three three to four hour services that we did annually, um, people of all ages would participate and they knew why things were done in, in this way and that way. So empowerment is key. Thank you. We have a question from Jose E. Banks, um, put in the Q&A. He, he writes, many immigrants come with their form of worship different than the reformed way of worship. Many use, a worship, use worship as a way of expressing freedom, using their bodies as worship and dance. How would the Reformed Church integrate this way of worship? Um, so I love this question. Um, you may or may not know that I have a I have a had a twenty year background in um, in dance and performance, and uh, I know that people will describe Reformed folks or maybe specifically Presbyterians as the frozen chosen. But I studied with a really wonderful professor, um, Myra Rivera Rivera. Some folks may know her, and she taught a wonderful class called Theology of the Bodies. And the claim that she made, I thought was fascinating. She said that we claim to worship an incarnational God who was embodied, um, but then we don't really live out of our bodies in our understanding of who we are. And, it, and it's ironic uh, that we that our that our faith centers a body, and then we are these very heady intellectuals. So, while it might not be reformed, I think the the incarnation does say something to us that calls us to maybe experience and understand ourselves in another way. So, at, at Riverside, since I've arrived, we do embodied practices before the sermons. And as I say to the congregation, part of the reason is some of the stories that we are ingesting on Sunday morning are heavy and hard. They're stories of, of rape and incest and murder, um, where whether we're conscious or not, um, trigger and tie to our own personal experience. And so to give the congregation an opportunity to, to stretch, you know, to look back, oh, stretch their hips and their necks and to invite them to breathe deeply. For some people, it's the first time all week that they've had a opportunity to think about the body that they're in. And we're carrying a lot of tension and tightness. And therapists who study somatic abolition would say that some of our dis-ease, some of our depression, anxiety, um, stems from our, our lack of connection with our body. So I just offer that as a, as a possibility that there might be ways in worship. And, and of course we see this in other traditions where people do move, you know, the, their arms are up. Even in the Catholic tradition, there's a, there's a genuflection and a, a blessing of oneself. Um, and so I maybe would turn that back to you and say, how can you bring some movement into your, you know, reformed understanding and, and, and worship? Because I think there's a, a foundation for it being there. James, if I may, since Jose E. Banks was a student of mine um, 10 years ago or so, hey, Jose, good to um, have you here. And um, in my in my presentation, I made reference to the prayers and liturgies of uh, in Abuja, Nigeria, because I was just there about three weeks ago for World Council of Churches Executive Committee. And when uh, folks ask me, how was Nigeria? Uh, the first thing I say is that in every church that we worshipped, Reformed, Lutheran, Methodist, Anglican, Baptist, whatever might be the case, the worship service that we went to, 
every single um, congregation danced and sung to the offering baskets. Every single one. I would love for us in the Reformed tradition to, to do that rather than just sort of sitting in the pews and having the plates pass. That, I think, is an immediate, um, quote, liturgical innovation. It would be innovative for, for um, American Presbyterians, uh, RCA, et cetera, to do that. But an offering and dancing to the offering, I mean, have, have, the, um, have the musicians in the worshiping community or the church play some um, jazzy music. And, you know, I mean, I'm Filipino-American. I like dancing. Uh, and have people dance if they're able to, right, if they're able to, to walk um, to the offering basket and dance. Because as we're bringing our offerings, we're bringing our whole selves. So I think that's a natural place that that can easily happen um, to introduce that to the, to the congregation, to a reform setting. Thank you, Neil. Um, let me say that in the in that Presbyterian church I'm helping out, um, they 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 we can, I haven't got them dancing up to up to with the offering yet, but I they all everybody brings their offering up to the plate rather than the plates going out to them. We started it during the pandemic because well this way we aren't passing things around, but um, I just sort of left it there. And so far, nobody nobody's objected. So I'm just leaving it there and letting them actually come with the offering. And it, I think it's a good thing. I want to thank both Adrian and Neil for their time here with us today. Um, glad to um, glad to have them here. Glad for this conversation. We're going to pause the conversation for now. I'll say, but of course, it does not need to end. In a couple of days, this the, the recording of this program will be up on nbts.edu, and you can find it there. Um, if you've been here in the program, you'll get a little note about where the link is for that, and you may share it with others um, as much as you want. Um, I also invite you to come back in January. Um, on January 17th, we will be together again, and... We will have J.P. Sundararajan, who is Director of Global Mission for the Reformed Church in America, and James Jinhong Kim, who is Professor of Missiology here at New Brunswick. And they will be talking about what missions maybe should look like in a post-colonial world. And so I hope you can be part of that conversation with us then and some of the other conversations that will be happening in the spring as we talk about hidden RCA women and support for women in ministry and um, whether there is racism in reformed church order and how we might address that. So lots of conversations. Oh, and creation care. We will have some more creation care discussions too. So lots of conversations to come. I hope you can be here with us. Have a good afternoon. Have a blessed Advent and a joyous Christmas. Take care. <laughs>